the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, those classic characters from comics, cartoons, movies, and now from Spec Evo Reimaginings. It's Ninja Time! Hello everyone! Today's episode will take us to the realm of these heroes in a half shell. But not only that, since today we are having a double feature of turtle power. First, we have a commission by Jackson Junger, taking a look at the turtles, the ooze, and some interesting abilities they develop in some media. And then, we'll see a more traditional specivo reimagining in the style of our channel, so please stay for that. And if you like any of this, please consider liking and subscribing. That would be cool as shell. And now, without further ado, let's get started. While science has always done its best to study and understand the world around us, there are some who would follow closely, trying to see how they can rip apart these discoveries for their own gain. One of these scavengers I and mean incorporations is the Technocosmic Research Institute, or TCRI a New York-based corporation that has been developing genetic modification technologies with military and paramilitary applications, particularly through the use of a programmable mutagen, nicknamed Ooze. The main element behind this experimental process were the, by now, well-known Titanomyces and Teratomyces fungi, utilized as a way to rewrite the DNA of a host in a way not too dissimilar to that of Dr. Brian Banner's experiments and later, of the army. However, unlike the uncontrolled strain seen in said experiments, these variants had been altered themselves through use of CRISPR technology to custom modify these fungi. Added to this, TCRI also implemented the Boiling Isles Bilesack fungus, with the intended purpose of giving test subjects similar abilities or, at the very least, passive enhancements as those seen in the inhabitants of the Isles. Lastly, a special genetic marker would be used to induce bioluminescence both on the ooze and the subject, thus providing an immediately visible marking that indicated the modifications had been successfully implemented. Despite their best attempts, however, it would take many failures to get this ooze to a semi-functional state with many deformed and non-viable test subjects being discarded over the years by TCRI, as well as ever-increasing quantities of flood ooze. Once the ooze was brought to a somewhat functional state, TCRI began experimenting both on willing subjects and on subjects that had no choice in the matter. Two of the most prevalent examples of this are the former criminals that TCRI altered as a bioweapon development test, nicknamed Bebop and Rocksteady. They were altered using an ooze variant modified to give them traits of, respectively, a warthog and a white rhinoceros. The results were less than ideal, having many drawbacks including a hand structure unsuitable for weapon use and an appearance that would reveal their presence from miles away. But they were more than enough as the addition of natural weapons, tough armored skin, and other animal-based properties proved the addition of custom traits would permit further experiments with more successful results. Some of the mutations caused by the ooze, however, were accidental, as is the case of a man who would come to be identified as Hamato Yoshi, a martial artist who left his native home in Japan due to undisclosed circumstances. And, as he attempted to start a new life, fate struck once again. Thanks to their vast resources, TCRI had managed to take shortcuts regarding the safe disposal of their waste and to avoid consequences of doing so. Therefore, a good part of their chemical and industrial wastes were unceremoniously dropped into the sewers, including, of course, the ooze. This discarded batch had, accidentally, but as a result of its inherent properties, absorbed the DNA of the rats living near it, and this is what would be used by the ooze to alter the destitute Hamato's body, twisting it into a rat-like visage. As a result of Hamato's appearance, fearing persecution from a world that had so bitterly treated him before, he decided to remain in the sewers, hiding from the rest of the world, 
expecting to live alone until the end of his days. Despite TCRI's best attempts, what would end up becoming the most notable examples of the Ouse effects would be a result of an accident as well. Aside from their body enhancement programs, TCRI had been using the Ouse to induce hybridization with commercial purposes, beginning from small invertebrates and moving on to increasingly larger creatures. Turtles were a common subject of the later stages of these experiments, since their longer lifespans would allow for more accurate long-term observation. Lucky for them, the comings and goings of such slow and unassuming animals were of little concern to the employees in charge, and so they had no issues escaping after a routine checkup. These animals, eventually, ended up running into recently discarded ooze. But before they were to grow and display the alterations presented by the ooze, they were still mere hatchlings without a chance of surviving in the world. Then, they met Hamato Yoshi. He took them in, and saw them grow into something far beyond mere turtles. See, this particular batch of ooze was mostly based around altered human DNA, as it was intended to create super soldiers, increasing their muscle mass and brain capacity, as well as giving them a light, but resistant, subdermal armor formed of densely packed collagen fibers. While unsuccessful when used in full-grown humans, the still-developing bodies of the baby turtles were altered by the ooze, causing them to develop following the human DNA alterations as they grew. Their anatomy not only became human-like, but they grew stronger and smarter than would be expected from most turtles and from many humans too. Even their large shells became increasingly lighter as they were overtaken by the Kevlar-like biological armor, allowing the turtles a high degree of speed and maneuverability without sacrificing protection. Of particular note are their hands, which suffered from a malformation as a result of the process, giving them fused fingers, but without much reducing their dexterity or strength. I mean, they were still better than those of a regular turtle. Hamato feared the turtles would face the same hate and rejection he feared for himself, and so he kept them down in the sewers, protected from harm. They grew strong, and, curious and smart as they were, the relationship between Hamato and the turtles soon evolved into something akin to that between a father and his children, with him even naming them after his favorite Renaissance masters, Leonardo, Donatello, Raphael, and Michelangelo. But, as we will see soon, not all heroes are born. Some are made. As the turtles grew, Hamato taught them, raised them, and even trained them, passing his wisdom and knowledge of martial arts onto them, including the art of Hamato Nimpo, his family's own art. Through this knowledge, the turtles achieved what no other test subject had managed, connecting with and utilizing the bile sac fungus that lived in them. By learning to do so, they developed a series of special abilities. As they grew, they developed their own personalities and tastes, and the abilities of each would be a reflection of themselves and of their fighting styles. Leonardo, focused and strategic, learned to create localized gravitational anomalies that could even form short-distance portals. Raphael, the most aggressive one, would create weapons from nothing but light. Donatello, always thinking and creating, learned to alter the composition of things to create physical objects from scrap. And finally, Michelangelo, carefree and chaotic, would generate flames around him. Whenever they used these abilities, the bioluminescent marker first inserted into the mutagenic ooze would become activated, fed by the energy released by the turtles' bodies, giving them an eerie, mystical glow. So that was a ton of fun, but now, let's take a quick second look at a spec evo version of these turtles. Let us go to the wetlands of the USA where four closely related species of turtle can be found. Upon discovery, 
it was believed they were related to the Kappa, having reached the American continent through rafting. But now it is understood the similarities between them are a result of convergent evolution. Their names, you will realize, are taken from those of famous Renaissance painters. As the field researcher who described them, Hamato Yoshi, was very fond of the arts. The first of these is known as the blue masked Leonardo turtle, the one that first diverged from this clade's ancestors. They live in loose, non-familiar groups where older, and therefore larger individuals, take precedence in breeding and feeding. Since they are partially aquatic, they take advantage of the blue markings on their body, a result of collagen accumulation that provides structural coloration to blur their form as they hide beneath the water. They hide not just from predators, but also as a way to catch prey unaware, and they will prey on almost anything that gets too close to the water's edge. In order to hunt, they will use the elongated claw located on each of their forelimbs, quickly injuring or even skewering prey before eating it. Next up is the red clawed Raphael turtle, identified and named after the three sharp claws on their arms, which are mostly used to fight other members of their species, depending on the thick skin around their arms and heads to protect themselves. Indeed, these turtles are extremely aggressive and territorial once they reach adulthood, and fights among them, or even attacks to other species, are extremely common. Their bright red ornamentations signal their maturity, alerting others against treading into their territory. The third of these species is the long-nosed Donatello turtle, closely related to the Leonardo turtle, as indicated by the similar collagen deposits on its skin that give it its very showy purple ornaments. As its name indicates, this species is most notable for the long projection growing from its face, which becomes sharper as they age. This projection is used to sense their surroundings in the murky waters they inhabit, doubling both as a deterrent against potential predators and as a tool to stun or injure prey, similar to the swordfish. Interestingly, this species is known to be very smart and easy to train, likely a result of the need to navigate and memorize their environment, and have often been used as models of reptile intelligence and behavior in biology studies. Finally, We'll take a look at the whiptail Michelangelo turtle. This is a very social species and forms large groups for protection, with unrelated younger specimens even displaying play behavior among themselves. Their characteristic bright orange markings help disguise them by making individuals blur into one another, confusing potential predators and preventing them from singling out any member of the group. However, these turtles will also go on the offensive when threatened, turning around and striking with their tails. Said tails have developed into long appendages crowned by small bony growths, which will flail around as the turtle moves its tail. While it is not strong enough to do any serious damage, hits from this tail will be painful enough to deter most predators, especially when plummeted by the tails of many turtles at once. Funnily enough, since many sewer drains connect to swamps and wetlands, Many baby turtles of this and other species have been known to get lost in the tunnels, eventually finding themselves living in this hostile environment and having to compete with other sewer fauna, including the sewer alligator and the greater Pennywise. And that's it for our two speculative biology looks into the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. This episode was a real blast, given how the original prompt by Commissioner Jackson involved a ton of the stuff we've been doing with the channel over time, including horizontal gene transfer, artificial organisms, and even omega particles, mostly inspired by the turtles as seen in Rise of the Teenage etc etc, also giving them some design cues, particularly in their accessorizing, from the last live-action movies. However, after that, I still wanted to do a second take on how I would have made these torts, as something entirely natural but resembling the characters as an extra bit of fun, adapting both their weapons and distinctive colors in ways that didn't feel too similar to one another. And while Leo and Ruff's weapons were rather easy to adapt into their anatomy, 
Danny and Mikey were a lot harder, but I like the way it worked out in the end. I hope you guys enjoyed these two looks at the turtles, and do let me know which of the turtles is your favorite. If you said Leonardo, ding ding ding, you are right. And as always, here's a thank you to everyone who wanted to see this episode. And of course, a huge thank you to our researchers and research associates who support us through Patreon and YouTube memberships. Especially to Jackson for commissioning and helping me work out the first half of this episode. As well as to our new patrons, Carlos and Aloe Verres. Remember, you too can join in if you want to support our channel. And you get some nice perks too, like seeing all of our creatures and videos ahead of time and helping mold them into shape. Or you can also like, subscribe or write a comment telling me any type of creature you would like me to give the Speckivo treatment in the show. Any of those really help the channel a lot. Thank you all for watching, and see you next time on the Speculative Wildlife Resource Center.